Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. Very happy to have Douglas Abrams here with me today. Uh, incredible gentleman, great energy, and he is, you know, I gotta say I'm a little jealous because he got to be with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu for uh, some solid quality time up in Dharamsala uh, celebrating the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday. And it was this magical week uh, where you'd put these two titans, these two spiritual legends uh, in, in you know, the same you know, structure. And with that, uh, there was an amazing thing that happened. So, you know, the book that he has co-authored with these two uh, is called The Book of Joy. And it's all about this experience and what, what came of it and really kind of the spirit behind it. So, man, Douglas, welcome, welcome to the show. Great to be here with you, Pedro. Wow. So, you know, I got to say, I, I am very jealous. Uh, that is such such an honor, really, to be with those two individuals uh, together. I mean, these are titans of our time. You know, it's like there are very few people of that caliber on the planet. And so you got them both in the same room for a while. What, what, what was the impetus for this? Like, how did this whole thing come about? And, and you know, like who, who decided it was time to fly Desmond Tutu to, to India? Well, let me say it was a daunting privilege. It was an incredible uh, opportunity, but it was an amazing responsibility as well to bring these two luminaries, these two icons together and to try to capture in the Book of Joy their not only their wisdom, but also their humanity, their humor. Um, the week we spent together was filled with just incredible um, delight and mischievousness and to capture all of that and try to bring the reader in on that journey and to experience what we got to experience during that week in Dharam Salah. And um, you asked, you know, what sparked this whole project. And so actually the project um, goes back, I guess the, the first thing to say is that the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu who have only actually met about a half a dozen times because world leaders and icons don't get a lot of time to just hang out um, and you know with their buddies but they have become buddies and they call each other mischievous uh, spiritual brother and they just love each other and they just so enjoy being with each other and the Dalai Lama was supposed to come to the Archbishop's 80th birthday in South Africa as the guest of honor and unfortunately he was not issued a visa so he was not allowed to uh, go to South Africa. Um, and they ended up having a quite an amazing Google Hangout where they spoke to each other, but they didn't actually get to see each other. So when the Dalai Lama was turning 80, um, actually we were down in South Africa with the Archbishop for his wife's birthday. And I was there with a gentleman named Jim Doty, who was the head of the Dalai Lama Foundation. And he said, well, what about the idea of these two amazing men doing a book together? And we turned to each other and we said, joy. It would have to be on joy. <laughs> and these are two of the most joyful people on the planet. And um, so we said to Archbishop Tutu, we said, hey, Arch, as he, like, he likes to be called, or his, buddy, his friends call him, you know, do you want to do a book with the Dalai Lama? And he said, I'd do a book. I'd, I'd do anything with that man. Um, <laughs> as they just love each other. And so after, you know, it was a period of uh, quite a while to get you know them together and the archbishop has been sick and so it was quite an issue of the logistics but we were able to fly archbishop tutu to dharam salah for a week together and it was just uh it was magical from start to finish um the dalai lama met us on the tarmac um and you know their greeting their their love i mean they you'll see there's the pictures in the book you see the kind of embrace um and the way in which, you know, the the archbishop will hold the Dalai Lama's cheeks and the face. I mean, it's as if these, you know, the two bestest, oldest friends getting together. And it was just a week of incredible, unconditional love and humor. So did you set up this week so that you could put them in a room and whatever came of it became the book? Like this, this whole thing was curated around a birthday visit and the birth of a book that would come of this experience? Yeah, they really wanted to give a gift to the world for their birthdays. You know, um, it was really how do we um, make this time together something that is a benefit to the world? I mean, they, as you probably know, they're all about 
what they can give. Um, you know, their 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 birthday gifts are about giving uh, much more than receiving, and they wanted to create this gift of their um, you know kind of shared philosophies of life, their values. Um, as you probably know, the Dalai Lama talks about joy and happiness as the kind of core of life. You know, the the, the very purpose of life is to seek happiness and um, to seek satisfaction and fulfillment. And so the opportunity to have a dialogue together about what they each believe in the deepest recesses of their heart and soul and, and really how it is that these two men who have experienced incredible hardship and suffering in their lives, whether that's the oppression of uh, apartheid South Africa or the uh, exile that the Dalai Lama has experienced from Tibet with his people, uh, how do these two men who face so much of their own personal suffering, their nation suffering, the world suffering, how do they find this incredible wellspring of joy? And that was the purpose of the book, was to try to help them articulate that for the world. As an author, um, being one myself, and I'm kind of in, yeah. in, in the, the throes of doing my next book, and, and you know, I've got my own process. Uh, you know, I've sure. got to pull that out of my own head. So you have these two kind of infinite fountains of wisdom and joy that are just kind of spewing. It's like you, you have these two geysers. And so how do, you, <laughs> how do you even go about saying, okay, guys, let's go? Like, how do you, how do you write a book uh, around an experience like this? Well, the, from the start, the book was kind of envisioned as a three-layer cake, uh, if you will, a uh, th three-layer birthday cake with their personal stories, which they share these just incredibly revealing and profound stories from their lives, um, the, um, their spiritual philosophies, their ideas, what, uh, what they believe, uh, as well as the science. And this is interesting because they both are, are, even though they're men of faith and uh, of religious icons, they believe deeply in the importance of science and of what they, uh, the archbishop calls self-corroborating truth. And so the idea was to take the stories, their dialogue, their ideas, and to um, help uh, bolster that, or if you will, or contrast that with, I mean, in many cases, most of the cases, it was validating it with, with the scientific uh, uh, research as well, which was interesting. Actually, I, should, I guess I should say a four-layer cake, if we're, uh, because the other piece of it was the travelogue, which was the idea of what it was actually like being there, what it was like in the room. Um, we had this incredible week together, and it wasn't just about the dialogue. We actually got to break bread together. We, the Dalai Lama taught the Archbishop how to meditate. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, received communion from the Archbishop. Um, they, we had a birthday party for a surprise, small little birthday party for 2,500 people for the Dalai Lama. Um, so, and actually, during the birthday party, the Dalai Lama danced for the first time in his life. Um, and there's actually a picture in the book of uh, when, you know, the archbishop is African, say no more, you know, you can't, you know, he's just, he's got great rhythm and, and boogie and he gets up and, you know, the Dalai Lama, because he's a Buddhist monk, he hasn't been able to, uh, he has been not permitted to dance. And so the archbishop coaxed him up and got him to do this little wonderful shimmy and jazz hands. And it was just, it was, it was magical to watch them. And it was just this wonderful expression of, of the joy of their relationship relationship and the joy of the experience of being together. So it was pretty, pretty incredible. Amazing. So, trying to get all of that in the book. So as you said, as a, as a writer, uh, you know, you, you're typically you're dealing with your thoughts or your stories here. We're braiding together, weaving. It was like a tapestry of these stories, these ideas and, um, and the experiences that they were having together with uh, five film cameras circling around them. Well, that certainly helps, doesn't it? Because you, you, yes. yeah, you, ca you capture it all and then you go make sense of it later and, and yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That definitely helped. Yeah, my goodness. I, you know, I, I've been there. I've been to McLeod Ganj and spent, I had the fortune of sitting with the Dalai Lama for some time. He was teaching the Bardo. So I, I was just very fortunate. I got to meet him there okay. in his house and all that. And it's, it's, it's a very powerful place. I mean, for those who don't yeah. know Dharmsala, it's, he has this complex. It's, it's you know, look, it's, it's very modest. It's, you know, it's where the Indian government gave him, uh, you know, kind of this refuge after the whole exile thing. And so it's not like a palace palace. It's just, a, you know, kind of a, a compound. 
around uh, on yeah. this very majestic hill with just just Tibetan monks walking around praying and, and spinning prayers everywhere. And so did you get to walk the grounds? I mean, were there like occasions where it was just free flow uh, on the grounds there? Yeah, there there were times where we were walking together. There was walking meditation times. Uh, you probably know about, uh, you know, you probably walked the circle around. Uh, many of the Tibetans there walk, uh, you know, circumambulate the palace and their prayer wheels and, you know, incense. And uh, there are monuments to those who have, uh, to the suffering in Tibet. Um, it's a very moving, you know, you know, it's very beautiful. Um, as you said, it's, it's not the thousand room palace that the Dalai Lama had, uh, when he was, uh, living in, in Lhasa in Tibet, um, before the exile. But I, even this was so incredible to me was just, I mean, we were talking about joy and, and in the face of suffering, right? It was in really not just about, you know, you know, don't worry, be happy. This was about how do we find joy in, you know, the realities of our own lives and the reality of our world, which is, is so often filled with suffering. And, the, you know, the Dalai Lama told us a story of the flight of uh, into exile the night that he had to leave Tibet. And this very moving story about passing by the Chinese garrisons and summiting 10,000 feet and, and encountering snowstorms and sandstorms and 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 really you know he was quite in danger for his life as the party if they had been discovered um and just his ability i mean we talked about you know fear and and death and we talked about just the ability to see that experience and one of the things he talked about was how he looked at that experience and he said you know this suffering is an opportunity this suffering that I have experienced and my people have experienced is this opportunity that has given me this wider exposure to the world that I would never have had if I had been in that gilded cage in that palace in Lhasa. And I think that was one example of the ways in which they shared their way they see the world, their perspective, the way they see reality and see suffering in such a beautiful way that really just opens our eyes to a new way of seeing our own lives. You, you know, both of them have a very interesting through line. I mean, uh, neither of these guys had it easy, right? Um, and they, you know, there's this kind of mm. misconception in the West, at least in Western spiritual circles, where, you know, there's this real serious kind of aversion to pain and suffering and moving towards this thing called joy um, that isn't actual joy. It's, it's kind of this aversion for, it's kind of the classic quintessential Buddhist suffering, right? And so mm. the Dalai Lama metabolizes suffering. The Dalai Lama takes that and turns that into real joy. And you see, anyone who's met the Dalai Lama just stops and goes, oh, oh, right? I've never had the, 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 the privilege of meeting the Archbishop, but I hear the same of him. So there are yeah. remarkable individuals that are doing something with suffering that is very special, right? It's almost like mm -hmm. alchemy. So, you know, when you're with them, you feel it. And so right. did, they, did they get into the methodology? Did they get into any of the kind of practices that allow them to, to be this way? Because it, it's real, it's authentic joy. It isn't something you're pretending to be. It's a great question. And actually, you know, the book ultimately got structured into three different parts. Uh, and the first part is the nature of true joy. And I think that speaks very much to what you're talking about, which is what is this that we're talking about? What is joy? How is it different from happiness? How is it, uh, you know, what is it? You know, it's a, it's actually a very rich and, and complex human experience. Um, the scientists actually say that there are, you know, four fundamental human emotions, uh, fear, anger, sadness, and joy. So, and if you think about those, we often call fear, anger, and sadness negative emotions, and joy obviously is a positive emotion. So, in fact, what we're exploring here is what makes life you know, positive and exciting and fulfilling. It's really the whole nature of of human experience. And of course, we were also talking about fear, anger, and sadness a great deal in in the week as well. And so then, so that was the that was the first day we talked about that and and 
really dive deeply into that. And then the second and third day was on the obstacles to joy. So everything from fear and uh, frustration and anger and envy to illness, suffering, and even fear of death. Um, then the final two days were spent talking about the eight, what they were calling the eight pillars of joy, which are really four pillars of the heart and four pillars of the mind. And so they really did get um, very specific about their ways in which they sustain joy. And I think one of the, the most important things to say is when we're talking about true joy, what I discovered in these dialogues is that they're not talking about a state. So all of us, you know, we all kind of experience joy. Oh, wow, that was wonderful, ice, you know, scoop of ice cream. I'm feeling joyful. You know, so, you know I, I saw my, my loved one. I feel joyful. Um, my team won the game. <laughs> their team won the game. I'm feeling joyful. What they're really talking about is joy not as a state that we enter into and, and fall out of, but as a trait as a quality of our character and our lives and an approach to life. So that was really the nature of true joy. That was what we actually got to. And those eight pillars of joy that we got to at the end are really what, what they described as joy is actually the byproduct of those eight qualities that we cultivate in our life. Because, you know, you can't, you know, the way the Archbishop phrased it is, you know, if you search after joy, you're going to miss the bus. You're, you know, it's that you're almost like it's uh, joy comes up as a surprise for everything that you have, the way you're looking at your life, the way you're approaching the sorrow that you encounter in your life, the way you're treating other people. That's what brings us joy. That's uh, an operating system upgrade that I think <laughs> most of us can use, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you have these different criteria. So as information comes in, and Lord knows there's plenty of information in our day and age, right? Yeah. And, you know, and to, to make us feel like the world is crumbling and all these sorts of things. And these guys both had it kind of rough. Uh, and so this is kind of proof positive that this interface is actually netting out this personality trait, which is a really interesting you know, statement, a social statement, and also a social experiment that we can all start to be a part of as we step into this, right? And you know, one's a Buddhist, one's a Christian. Uh, you know, yeah. these, these are, this is really non-denominational in, in the kind of framework from what I'm hearing. Yeah, it was really important to them. The Dalai Lama said to me when I, uh, I met him before the dialogues, and he said, you know, this is not a Buddhist book. This is not a Christian book. This must be a universal book. And I think that is also speaks to why the, the value of the science for them, which mm -hmm. is this is not an not to be taken as an article of faith. This is about um, discovering the universal principles of being human. And I think, as you said so powerfully, you know, when we kind of bring these two great world traditions of Buddhism and Christianity together, these two amazing icons and men who are very much in the, the world um, as well. Um, the archbishops raised a family. They've both been engaged with reality as, and, you know, the, the necessities of life throughout their life. We're really just talking about what is it about this that is about being human and how do we become more human? And I think actually that's one of the things I would say. You know, I've worked with the, with the archbishop for over a decade, and um, I think one of the things you, you experience when you're with him, and I think you experienced it when you were with the Dalai Lama, is in some ways these are you know we want to venerate these two men and say they're 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 beyond human, but what they are is this full expression of what it's like to be human, what you can aspire to, what we can all aspire to in our humanity, and they're just an extraordinary example of what that can look like when we are able to, as you said, upgrade the system and uh, and and be human 2.0 maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and they're living proof, and that's really, you know, and that, you know, some would say that was, you know, Jesus' role too, is to be living proof of that divinity in, in, in our incarnation and how one can do that through love, mm -hmm. through whatever interface yeah. we're talking about. Now, they also did, so, you know, South Africa had their Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, that Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela initiated, uh, and that was a really interesting bit of modern history where, you know, we yeah. learned from, you know, some very, from some very dark practices, some very dark times that if 
South Africa were to just suddenly go back and say, okay, now black people in charge and white people out, uh, it would tear the fabric of that society. So there was this really interesting kind of heartfelt process that really helped that country heal. Um, I, I don't know if you were with him during that time, but that, that, that was a, you know, I don't think that that process gets enough press. I don't think that people really understand how, how powerful that was in kind of that, the, the actual, you know, the stated goal of reconciliation. Uh, and, you know, it's still, I mean, look, look, every country's got its problems, but it's, it's a mm -hmm. country that's alive and well and really came out of that in a positive way. Yeah, it's a it's a important thing to and many people who are listening to the podcast may not remember or may not even been alive when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission happened. But when Nelson Mandela was relieved from prison and became the president of South Africa um, after a, you know a, an apartheid regime which had oppressed the black South Africans. He and Archbishop Tutu, but it was uh, Nelson Mandela's initiation, wanted to heal the country. And the way to do that, they knew, was through forgiveness. And the Dalai Lama, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Nelson Mandela asked um, Archbishop Tutu if he would be the chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And people were able to talk about what had happened to bring the truth to life um, and to be given amnesty, to not be sent to jail if they you know told the truth and uh if it was seen that these were politically motivated acts and it was really an extraordinary experience of healing and the archbishop told some stories from that some incredible stories about you know kind of hearing these unbelievable stories of brutality and anguish and you know being brought to tears and you know making what he called a, a public spectacle of himself because he was so moved by what he was hearing but one of the things that about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is the importance of forgiveness. And um, one of the four pillars of the heart that they talk about in the eight pillars of, uh, of joy is forgiveness and how releasing that desire for a different past, that ability to forgive and let go of the suffering that one has experienced is so profound and so important for being able to actually be grateful and appreciative and experience your life now. I mean, we can't be in joy if we're constantly in bitterness and seeking revenge um, and thinking about what's how we've been wronged. And so that forgiveness, which the Dalai Lama was very adamant is about, you know, I mean, it was really wonderful to see him get all kind of upset. We asked, you know, we gathered actually a, a thousand questions from around the world that we had to whittle down and, and kind of ask in, in terms of asking them these questions about joy. But one of them was about, you know, whether forgiveness was weak. And he said, forgiveness is not weak. Forgiveness is strength, you know. And the archbishop said, you know, if you... Uh, you know, if you anybody who thinks that forgiveness is 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 weak hasn't tried it. Um, and it was just it was beautiful to see them talk about the importance of forgiveness, not only for countries like South Africa, but the importance of finding forgiveness in our own lives as well. Yeah, well, these guys, I mean, Dalai Lama is, you know, was former head of state, technically head of some some state, right, in, 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 in mm -hmm. a weird way. Uh, and listen, China's been squeezing him for, for decades now, right? It, and he's got a lot to forgive. And, you know, it's the point where his, you know, he couldn't even go visit his buddy for his 80th birthday because South Africa put, had pressure put on it by China and basically iced him. He didn't get his visa. So, I mean, right. he, he's still dealing with it every day of his life. And, you know, he's still smiling. Well, we had a question from about a, uh, I think it was a, a fourth grader who actually wrote it in this wonderful fourth grade handwriting, you know, you know, can you forgive China? Um, and it was quite amazing to see how he, first of all, he separated forgiveness from, you know, seeking justice, right? So forgiving China doesn't mean that uh, he is going to, you know, that he's willing to accept everything that's being done by Chinese officials in Tibet. Um, he also made that big distinction between the Chinese people and the officials who are, are doing harm in, in Tibet or who have uh, occupied Tibet. Um, he also, uh, you know, quite powerfully just um, was willing to 
accept the humanity of the people and have compassion for the people who are even doing what in you know many cases is quite uh, horrendous or heinous acts and to recognize i mean it's quite powerful to hear him talk about how they are harming themselves from his perspective karmically you know you have you can actually feel sorry for these people who are doing these things that will lead to great suffering in this life or in in, in the buddhist concept concept potentially another um, but that ability to have compassion for those who we often would want to have revenge against or um, was very powerful to see and it didn't mean that it meant inaction or acquiescence uh, it meant that forgiveness ultimately was about uh, letting go of I mean the Archbishop Tutu has written a whole book called the book of forgiving and you know talks about how you know forgiveness is giving up our right for revenge right because that's our kind of natural impulse uh, we have a kind of natural impulse to to hit back when we're hit um, and we also have a natural impulse to want to forgive and it's reconciling those two aspects of our humanity and that was the other thing i think that was quite incredible to see was that they just had this incredible acceptance and compassion for all the ways that we are human and all the ways that they are human and uh, that was and that was actually it was interesting to see they, they had some disagreement there in in some ways of how to deal with negative states but it was really quite incredible to see the kind of love that they have the self-love the love for others that allows this joy to to take root as well this love uh there are a lot of practices in tibetan buddhism that yeah. cultivate that like you know these guys spend a lot of time chanting and getting into the heart and opening it up uh, and uh, you know obviously you know in the christian tradition you cultivate love mm -hmm. and you pray and you, you open up your heart how much yeah. of this how much of this kind of lineage uh driven uh love do you think has been kind of embodied in them as well like do you see the people around them also a reflection of some of this like are these guys like remarkable like you know examples that 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 are you know uh rainbow like uh, unicorns or are they actually <laughs> you know what i'm saying or are they just you know kind of the, the the figureheads of movements that are also kind of bringing other people along this kind of energy curve well, it's an interesting question, and I think the way that we explored it was uh, the fact that compassion is really the heart of both Buddhism and Christianity. And I think that there, these two traditions have just been extraordinary, and, and frankly, all the world's traditions are trying to cultivate that heartfulness and one of you know in a in a kind of in a phrase one of the things the dalai lama said in um in our discussion was that really it is you know ha you know happiness and satisfaction in life is a warm heart in a healthy body so that warm heartedness that you're talking about was really central to their understanding of what leads to a joyful and fulfilling life and i think that their traditions are, you know, all of every world, you know, religion is a very complex and rich collection of different kinds of traditions. But I think as they understand their traditions, at the heart of their traditions is this desire to pursue compassion, to open the heart, to connect the, the, the you know, the, the brain that we have up here in our heads with the brain that's here in our, in around our chest and connect that in a way that when, you know, that allows us to be wiser and healthier and more generous. Um, so I definitely think, I don't think, uh, you know, I think there are extraordinary examples. I don't think they're the only one, you know, ones out there. I don't think they're unicorns. Um, I would think that they are towering examples. But as I said, you know, they're very human. You know, I mean, when we had this one, one of the great discussions or moments in our time together, you know, we, we talked about the difference between joy and pleasure. And, you know, as you probably know, in Buddhism, often a lot of the, the goal is to detach from the, the senses and the kind of superficial sense of pleasure or a kind of superficial understanding of joy. And, you know, at one point we were having lunch and the Dalai Lama was given a, a bowl of rice pudding and he turned to me and he said, I love this. And it was just 
fantastic to see, you know, him really enjoying his lunch and, you know, that, you know, being spiritual, being, you know, this kind of serene spirituality and joyfulness does not mean that you deaden yourself to the pleasures of life. It doesn't mean you deaden yourself to life. And I think that was one of the other really key profound insights that came out of this uh, dialogue was that it's really, it's not that you experience joy or you, or you experience sorrow. It's that they're connected in a way that the more you actually face the sorrow and the suffering in your own life or in others' lives or in the world, the more you your capacity for joy increases. So it's really like you know a volume knob on life. You either turn it down and numb yourself to the pain, but also numb yourself to the joy, or you turn it up and then you experience both all of life more vibrantly, more fully. And I think that's really what you see when you look at them is here are people who can, when you meet the, the Dalai Lama, as you probably experience, you know, if you're in a state of sorrow or suffering, he will be with you in a way where he's looking so deeply and experiencing what you're experiencing. And Paul Ekman, who's one of the scientific researchers on emotion, says he does this more than anyone he's ever encountered in his life, that kind of empathy and that deep connection connectedness but then you're gone and then the next person who comes is filled with joy and laughter and he's there with joy and laughter and so some of this you know kind of you know trait of joy is the ability to allow the waves of of joy and sorrow of sadness and despair and grief and uh to wash over us and not to take up residency in our lives in in the ways that we often do when we kind of ruminate on our the negative experiences that we that we all have in our lives, and which we tend to do is to ruminate. Yeah. How much? Right. So the the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism in general, and there's you know several different like lineages and the Bon and the you know there's there's different kind of heads of state and the different lineages, but he comes from a very regimented tradition, right? And so, you know, mm -hmm. he's up for the first time at the age of 80 dancing because it ain't allowed, right? <laughs> and, it, it, right? And, and so, and there's lots of ritual, there's lots of prayer. Yeah. I, I'm curious whether or not you saw kind of a, a crack in that, that, that concrete in the kind of regimented Buddhist, it's, it's just, it's so much work being a Tibetan Buddhist in some ways. And now he's out <laughs> with scientists, he's dancing with Desmond Tutu. Like, is there, is there kind of a, a softening of the, of, the, of the borders there? where now it's like he's less Buddhist and more humanist. I, I, I don't know if he's, an, if he's allowed to even go there. Well, you know, I think um, I wouldn't necessarily make a distinction between Buddhist and humanist because I, I think he's so deeply, deeply no Buddhist. Yeah. Um, but I think what he, I mean, I think a lot of people in religious traditions of any sort get really, you know, caught up with the regimentation and the rituals and the routines in a way that can really cultivate some extraordinary humanity and can, in some cases, become rigid and, and uh, perhaps dampen that humanity. And uh, one of the ways that, you know, the story you were referencing, you know, as we talked about was this, you know, incredible birthday celebration that we were able to have in that we talk about in the book and just this amazing moment where the Dalai Lama, who has not been allowed to dance because of his monastic vows, uh, was urged up by Archbishop Tutu's irrepressible South African boogie and, you know, got up and was doing a little shimmy and a little jazz hands and so beautifully was expressing that, ex, you know, expression. It was it was a very moving moment. His, the, the school band, we were at uh, one of the schools that uh, the Dalai Lama has set up for children who um, leave Tibet and uh, are because they're not allowed to get a Tibetan education in Tibet. And these children are sent with guides over these mountain passes away from their families and often are not allowed, uh, don't see their families for 13 years. They often go as young as five and they might not see their families again until they're adults, if ever. And so there you see these, this, we were in this incredible school called the Tibetan Children's Village where these 
children are boarding and obviously have experienced enormous suffering in their own lives. And we actually part of the experience of the week was we heard these children sharing their unbelievably heart wrenching stories of, of leaving their families and, and coming to the Tibetan children's village. And then in the midst of these, you know, surrounded by these, um, you know, thousand, two thousand, five hundred kids, um, you know, the, the archbishop is saying to them, you know, I am here to tell you that you will be reunited with your families. You will be someday dancing in the streets of Tibet. And I mean, the place was just, uh, you know, was just it was unbelievable just to see the, how it erupted with joy and hope. And, you know, the, the band was playing, you know, we are the world. And so the archbishop got up there and he's all elbows and he's kind of doing his thing boogieing and he urges the, the Dalai Lama up and, you know, it was the Dalai Lama's, uh, you know, it was the Dalai Lama's first dance and it was just magical. And there's, you know, there's a picture of that in the book and, you know, um, actually some of the, uh, the pictures and videos also on the website, um, bookofjoy.org, people can see some of the video we got, you know, 11 hours of incredible video that we've tried to edit down. There will be actually a documentary film that we're, we're working on as well based on this experience. Um, but yeah, it was so moving to be there. And I think what we tried to do with the book was to allow everybody to be there and to experience this really directly. Which is what books are for and what they're about. So you've captured a, you've captured a, a moment in history that is remarkable. And now you're, you're you know, immortalizing it by, by sharing it with everyone and kind of making sure that the spirit of that carries on and goes to all, all walks. So I'm, I'm assuming this book's going to be translated into multiple languages and it's going to be everywhere. Um, it's beautiful. Um, the, not only does it have a beautiful paper cover, it actually, I was surprised to find that it's actually kind of old school, well, well designed hardcover the way they used to be. And you know, a lot of book publishers get lazy about this. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a great looking book. I've, I've only flipped through it and I'm gonna be reading it this next month when I have some downtime and sitting with it. It's called The Book of Joy um, by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu with our good friend Douglas Abrams who uh, is, uh, what, what a sweet, sweet energy you have. Man, you, uh, you've oh, done something you. right. You've done something right to be hanging out thank with the likes you. of these guys. Thank you so much. It was uh, it was a, a deeply uh, it was the summit of a lifelong journey that required every ounce of uh, skill and every ounce of my own suffering to be able to be there and to be able to share this. Um, and thank you for you know, the the historic moment. I, I think you know what we didn't realize when we were putting this all together was really how historic this was and mm -hmm. and would be. This was this is the la this may be the last time they're ever together. Um, it certainly was the only time in their lives that they will have ever had this kind of time together. Um, and it was just, it was a moment of extraordinary meeting. And um, one of the things I guess that they would say is the, this, the quickest way to experience joy is to bring joy to others. And what we didn't realize was how much joy this would actually give them and what that their meeting would mean to them, um, getting this kind of time together. Um, and you just experience that and feel that. And it's a wonderful model of what's possible for all of us. Yeah. Well, and that's just it. It's a, it's an operating system upgrade. If it, you know, if this was all about saying, Hey, these two guys are so special and lucky them, look how happy they are. That's, yeah. You know, that, that, that's kind of boring. That's not, that's not inspirational, <laughs> right? It's just like, oh man, now, you know, now, now I'm bummed. Um, you know, I, I wish I could be that happy. But the, but the point is they've, they've drawn a path and they're pulling us up with them on this path to a more joyful existence. And it's, and it's all of our path, right? We can all, we can all experience this. Exactly. And then, you know, it was interesting. We, we didn't anticipate this when we went into it, but in the end, we included about 50 pages of their joy practices and their spiritual practices at the end of the book. So readers could actually, you know, do what they do when they're faced with anger or sadness or suffering. Um, and um, it was it's been very profound to be able to share those practices to do those practices i need to do them for a lot longer uh but it's it's it is a process um and it is a, a model for all of us and it's uh been a joy to be able to to help give it 
to the world in some, you know, and play some small role in that. And there's also a kind of a disintermediation of all this, right? Back in the day, you don't just go get the Dalai Lama's joy practices um, and you know get tra- <laughs> this kind of transmission or Desmond Tutu's you know yeah. personal practices. These these were all kind of built into hierarchical systems, and now you have the heads of lineages kind of coming together and freely giving of all the special sauce because times have changed and the world yeah. is different, and, and Lord knows the world needs it. So you know the, these are magical, magical practices that come down from people who've uh, run the miles and shown that they work. And so all we got to do is plug in and do them. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's on us, right? That's on, that's on us as listeners and viewers. It's on us to do the work and do the practice. So Doug, man, this has been great. I really, really appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you for, Thank you. for doing this. Thank you. It's, it's, it's an important piece of work and I, and I honor, I, I honor like everything that you've done around this. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure being with you today. It's been fantastic. And, you know, I'm, I'm just so excited about what this book can do for those who get the opportunity to read it. Um, it's uh, it has already transformed my life just being a part of it. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, for those of you who have not checked it out, it's called The Book of Joy, um, and it's going to be everywhere. Uh, this is Dr. Pedram Shojai, The Urban Monk. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Uh, theurbanmonk.com, got lots of resources there, and we'll put links to all, all of these here as well. I'll see you next time.